I put this in the comments. It's something the Lord's been dealing with me about recently. Um, or I put it in the, in the title, I should say. It's a, a life-changing secret of, of King David. Something that really he kept with him um, in his whole, in, throughout his entire life that brought him victory after victory after victory after victory. Never-ending victory throughout his life. And um, I've been really digging deep into this, taking notes on this, because the Lord's been showing me different things about it from his word. And uh, I'm sure I'm going to be using it very soon for something because the Lord doesn't usually give me all these thoughts and things like that unless we're getting ready to use it for something. And I'm sure it's going to be great. I'll let you know when we do. But um, I want to start with you in 1 Samuel chapter 16. You can literally apply this to your own life at any given time. And it will always bring open doors and victories, open doors and victories. Of course, you know, we've been talking about the fact that this is our year of divine possession. Uh, we're going to do what we've never done, have what we never had and go where we've never gone. But again, as I said last week, these things are not random. They're not arbitrary. They don't just sovereignly happen. They happen because God's people are faithful. God's people take steps of faithfulness. And so this is one of those things that when you apply it, it will without question bring, bring that kind of victory and open doors to pass in your own life. And so we're looking at, at King David's life, and uh, I don't know how many sessions this, this will take up. Maybe we'll get through it all today. Maybe not. But we're starting in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And uh, I want to I wanna start there because of, if you understand the backstory to this, Saul is the current king of Israel. But God speaks to Samuel, the prophet, and uh, tells him to stop grieving over Saul because Saul's not living for God the way he should be. He's not, he's lost the anointing, if you will. And he said, how long will you grieve over Saul? I'm in 1 Samuel 16. I started in verse one. How long will you grieve over Saul since I've rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I've provided for myself a king among his sons. So notice that when God speaks to the prophet Samuel, he said, I've provided for myself a king among his sons, but he doesn't tell him which son it is. He does not tell the prophet which son it is. Then we find out later that Jesse has eight sons. But the, the prophet doesn't know that ahead of time. He's going by faith that God will reveal who that next king is when he gets there. And so Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to, to the sacrifice. And I'll show you what, you'll should, what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. So the Lord has a plan to show Samuel which young man is supposed to be the king, you see. So he gets all the way to uh, Jesse's house. And uh, when he gets there, uh, verse six, when they came, he invited all of his sons. He looked on Eliab and thought, surely, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Now think about that. He looked at the outward appearance of this son and thought, this has got to be the king. This has got to be the king. And it was not. Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So there's a principle for you. God doesn't always choose who men would choose, who women would choose. God chooses people based upon the state of their heart, their faithfulness. Get this in your spirit now and put it in the chat, put it in your, in your, uh, in your notes. God chooses people based upon the state of their heart. He doesn't even choose people based upon uh, their own uh, personal skills, he doesn't choose people based upon their stature, their relationships, their connections. 
He doesn't choose people based upon that. He chooses people based upon the state of their heart. This is very important for us to understand as we're talking about this, because when obviously at the end of this, we're applying it to you, which is as God is making his choice about who he's going to use, notice something that the devil always makes you feel like God couldn't use you because of the fact well, this, I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have the connections. I don't have the experience. I don't have the stature. I don't have the skill set. Whatever those things might be. The devil always points out what you don't have. But God's not basing his, uh, whether or not he can use you, whether or not you can function in his kingdom based upon your personal pedigree. That's not how God chooses people. And in fact, think about it. When God chooses people, he then equips them for their service. So God chooses who he sees that their heart is prepared for what he's called them to do. And then if God's called you, God will equip you. If God has called you, God will equip you. Hallelujah. I love that thought. If God has called you, then God will equip you. That'd be something to write down. That's something to put in the comments. If God called me, then God will equip me. You never have to wonder whether or not God's going to be able to use you because of, you know, what you can or can't do or have or haven't done in the past. If God called you, he's going to equip you. And so uh, that's what happens here. And all of Jesse's sons are rejected by God. And, God, and Jesse and Samuel made all of them pass by him. And one by one, uh, none of them were the one God has chosen. The verse 11 is where it gets really interesting. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. And he said, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is he. And Samuel, now look at this, so powerful. Here, here it starts. Here it starts. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. I, I want to say, say something here. Isn't it interesting that it seems as though, now there are other, uh, there are other historical, possibly historical reasons for this, um, but it, it seems as though David's own father didn't even believe in him. Doesn't that strike you as odd? that Samuel, the prophet, is speaking to Jesse, and he's like, listen, God has sent me here to your house to anoint one of your sons as the next king of Israel. And so what does Jesse do? Jesse then calls his seven oldest sons into the room and leaves David out in the field with the sheep, as though there's no way it could be David. I mean, it's like, this is like, it's like Jesse's thought process. There's no way that it could be David, so we're just going to go ahead and leave him out in the field with the sheep. And Samuel is blown away. It's none of these sons. Don't you have any other sons? Well, you know, I do have, I do have one other son. Well, bring him in then. Bring him in. So it seems like uh, David was the least of his brothers. I mean, not only is he the youngest, but he seems as though he was the least of his brothers and that his father didn't even believe in him enough to bring him into the room to even have him looked at by the prophet. But I love this verse in verse 13 because no notice what it says. It says, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. So it's not just, I'm sure his father was still standing there. The midst of his brothers and his father, which means that all who may not have even thought it could not, it couldn't be David, not David. I, I mean, he's the youngest. He's just a shepherd. I mean, not, not David. Some of them were soldiers as we'll find out in a moment. No, it couldn't be David. And then what does God do? 
God blesses David and anoints David and equips David right in front of and in the middle of those who didn't even believe he could be anointed. He could be used by God. When God blesses you and God uses you, it won't be some small thing. It will be seen by men. They will have to testify of God's goodness in your life. That's what was happening with David. Though others thought he was the least, God said, no, you're not the least. You're the one I'm choosing to be the king. You're a man after my own heart. Powerful, powerful. Now, look at this. The Bible says, uh, he, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now, it's interesting because as soon as the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David, this is a key for everybody listening and watching. It didn't fill his heart with pride. David just found out, I am anointed to be the next king of this entire nation, but it didn't fill his heart with pride. What did it do? David had the revelation of who he was going to be, but he stayed in a place of servanthood, stayed in a place of humility, stayed in a place of meekness. And he's still in a, in a, in a position where he's serving. And notice this, David goes into Saul's service. And the Bible says uh, that obviously there was an evil spirit uh, from the Lord that tormented Saul's mind and his men had an idea. Well, let's, let's get somebody that can play skillfully on the harp to come into your courts and play. And he said, that's a great idea. Who, who could we get? And they said, we already know somebody like this. His name is David. And he's the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Bethlehemite. And he said, uh, he sent word and said, send me David, your son, who's with the sheep. So you know what that means? David got anointed to be the king. And what did he do? Went right back to the sheepfold. Think about this. Think about the humility it took. Think about the meekness that it took to do what he did. Okay. I am the next king of this entire nation. Now I'm going to go right back to doing what I was called to do. I'm going to go right back to my responsibilities. I'm going to go right back to being faithful over the thing that my father put me in charge of watching the sheep. Now that's amazing because how many people do you know that the moment they get a whiff of the fact that God might use them, that they might have a gift, they might have a talent, that they immediately, it rushes to their head, and now I'm prophetess so-and-so. I'm a prince of praise and worship. I am a psalmist. I mean, how as soon as they get a whiff that God might be using them in their life, it immediately becomes a title. It immediately becomes something that they have, uh, they start to build their pride around. David didn't do that. I'm gonna teach you a principle here. It's gonna change your life. Though he knew he was anointed, though he knew he was called and purposed by God, he also stayed faithful and went right back to faithful service of his responsibilities and what he was called to do currently. Powerful thought here. And I'm going to show you in a moment how this changed his entire life. And it did change his entire life. And so here he is. When the king calls for him, notice where they had to find him. The Bible said, send me your son who's with the sheep. So you know where he is. He went right back to tending the sheep, right back to being faithful. Yeah, that's right. Sean said they start printing business cards. I don't know if you know who I am, but here's my card. I'm, I'm prophet. <laughs> I like meeting people that tell me they're apostle so-and-so. And I'll say, oh, really? I'll say, how, how many churches have you started? Well, we, we really haven't started any at this point. I... <laughs> hint, hint, you might not be an apostle. <laughs> uh, could you, I, this, this is my favorite, this is my favorite thing. Yeah, I have many leather-bound books. My apartment smells of rich mahogany. Um, my favorite is when people come to me at the altar. Hey, brother, would you pray for me? I'm apostle so-and-so. Yes, how can I pray for you? Well, I can't really find a job right now. I'm out of work. <laughs> I've, been, I've been out of work for three months, and I'm really believing that God's going to open up a, a job for me somewhere. 
I applied at the local Sears uh, at the fragrance section, but they rejected my application. It's like, uh, sign, you may not be an apostle. <laughs> oh, Lord. Self-proclaimed apostles. Self-proclaimed apostles. And it, it, it's mind-blowing. This stuff goes to people's heads, and they, and they start doing their own thing. And then people are like, uh, you start to realize pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And uh, Mike Frost said, I'm an apostle of used furniture. <laughs> and you start to realize <laughs> Sears shut down, Liz said. And for good reason, the apostles stopped working the fragrance counter. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy because, I mean, throw a hand up in the, in the comments. You've seen this. You know exactly what I'm talking about. People get a little whiff that they, they might be used by God, a little whiff, I'm anointed. And all of a sudden, they got their website, they got their business cards, they got their brochures, they got, I mean, I mean, if they had the money, they'd have billboards up. And that's how it works for most people because the enemy wants to use pride to destroy you. But humility and meekness are the keys to greatness. Humility and meekness are the keys to greatness. So notice, send me David, your son, uh, who is with the sheep. So J Jesse took a donkey laden with bread, skin of wine, young goat, sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And of course, you know the story. Verse 23, and whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So, so look at what's going on now. David's so anointed that as he goes into this, uh, this environment where this evil spirit is moving and acting, uh, as he just begins to worship the Lord, the Bible doesn't even say David sang anything, just played. He just played. And as he played, there was so much anointing. Remember what 1613 said, after Samuel anointed him, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. One translation said, and from that day, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David, came mightily upon him. And so now all he's doing is just playing. And as he's playing, evil spirits are departing. That's how anointed he was. As he's worshiping, without even singing a song, just playing the song, evil spirits are departing. Amen. Amen. Now, do you think he could have stood in that place if pride had filled his heart? If he'd have been in a place of uh, a, haughty, a haughty spirit, a prideful heart? No, that shuts things down. The Bible says in the book of James that um, God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud and gives more grace or favor to the humble. So when you walk in pride, when you walk in haughtiness, you're at opposition with God. He can't bless you. He can't bless you. He can't bestow his favor upon you while you walk in pride, while you walk in or with a haughty spirit. He can't. He opposes the proud. And I don't want God against me. I want God for me. Hey, faith. And, and then, if, of course, he gives more grace to the humble. That's what he's doing for David right now. He keeps on giving him more favor and more favor and more favor. All right. And so I, I want to go into this next segment because this, this, this shook me up. So now we finish verse 16 with the evil spirit departing from Saul after David played. Now we jump into chapter 17 of first Samuel and we see where the life change starts to happen and we see how it happened. Now, of course, you know that, uh, we, uh, start to see Goliath and the Philistines standing on the battlefield and opposing God's people. And Goliath is talking trash against God's people, against the God of Israel, and, and they won't uh, send anybody to fight him. And he's challenging one-on-one -on -one combat. Send somebody to fight me. Let's finish this whole thing with a man-to-man, a -man, one-on-one, single combat. They won't send anybody. In fact, they're, it seems as though they're ducking it. They're hiding and, and the first part of 1 Samuel 17 takes the time to describe uh, Goliath's greatness, how big he is, his weaponry, his armor, you know, how magnificent of a soldier that he is. And 
uh, we get down to verse number 10 and 11. Listen to this. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed, listen, and greatly afraid. Greatly afraid. Now, let's go to verse 12, and this is where the story starts changing. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Look at that. Still humble. He's still in his responsibilities. He's still being faithful to what he's called to do. He never has allowed this word from the Lord to fill him with pride. And that's getting ready to position him for greatness. Look at this now. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Now, here's the thing I want you to get. Verse 17. This is so powerful to me. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Verse 18. Also take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. That right there is, no, we're in 1 Samuel 17 now, and I just read to you uh, verses 17 and 18. 1 Samuel 17, verses 17 and 18. So this is why this is so powerful to me. Here we are with really Jesse talking to his son, who really is the next king of the entire nation, who is still being faithful with the sheep, and now he's getting a very, an instruction from his father, a very menial task. Here, take some bread and take some cheese. And I want you to take it out to the battlefield, take it to your brothers, take some cheese to the captain of the guard and get, bring me back some word about how your brothers are doing all this. And you never see one protest from David in this entire story. You don't see one protest. You don't see that. Dad, I don't know if you know who you're talking to, but I'm the next king of Israel. I don't know if you know. I've written psalms. Demons flee from me when I play the harp. I don't think you know who you're talking to, but I'm Bishop David and I'm from. The, he, he didn't get all he didn't get all prideful. Yeah, I don't know who, Dad, I don't know if you think I'm UPS for bread and cheese, but I ain't. You can find somebody, find a servant. You can find a servant to do this for you. You don't know who, you know, you know Samuel anointed me, dad. Samuel anointed me, dad. No help from you. Left me out in the field, dad. <laughs> he didn't do all that. Never bought me a PlayStation, dad. <laughs> had, to, had to go to the neighbors and play theirs. And David didn't get all like that with his father. Huh? He didn't do all that. <laughs> he could, you know, like people's natural flesh, people could have been, people could have been uh, offended. You know, I'm telling you, it happens today. It happens today. Pastor asked somebody, hey, would you mind staying after we need to clean the church up a little bit? <laughs> I'm telling you, Crack, cracks me up. People get all offended. Stay and clean the church. I'm an anointed psalmist of God. I don't, clean, I don't vacuum lobbies. I sing solos. I don't clean bathrooms. I play the piano. And people, they, they feel like that because God's put an anointing on them, they're now, they don't, there's nothing else they do. They don't serve the church. They don't serve the vision. They're not, 
They just, they do their own thing and that's it. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. And um, David never got like that. Tell me to take bread and cheese to the battlefield, dad. David didn't do that. In fact, we have no record whatsoever of anything David said. He just obeyed. He just obeyed. And so notice this. After he got that instruction from his father, the Bible says, Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines, and David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. Notice that. It's obedience. It's obedience. All this is faithfulness to his father. Obedience, faithfulness to his responsibilities, his calling, his purpose, where he is right now. Remember what the word of God says. If you're faithful over little, I'll make you ruler over much. If God couldn't trust David with a few sheep, how's he going to trust him with the nation of Israel? If God couldn't trust David to obey this small instruction of taking bread and cheese to the battlefield, how could he ever uh, trust him with a bigger instruction to subdue nations as the king of Israel? Obedience opens the door. Faithfulness opens the door. Humility opens the door. The Bible says he did as Jesse commanded him. And he came, notice this now, and he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper and the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath, who defied the armies of Israel, has, notice, he was doing it again with the same words as before, and David heard him. And all the men of Israel, when they heard the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And all the men of Israel said, have you seen the man who's come up? Surely he's come up to divide Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, this is verse 26, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Woo. Now, I want you to get this. this. This is so powerful right here. David would not have even been in position to hear the words of Goliath if he had not been an obedient servant for his father he would have still been in the sheepfold watching the sheep or out doing his own thing unless he'd been a faithful, obedient servant to his father. Notice, his obedience positioned him to hear Goliath's words. Notice, it was the thing that sparked David to action to get him ready to go fight. What? That he could not stand to hear what Goliath was saying about his God. It offended his faith. And you can see it because look at the verbiage that he uses in this passage. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Let me tell you something. He wasn't giving the, the soldiers an anatomy lesson. He wasn't just pointing out the fact that, you know, well, I notice he hasn't been circumcised. We need to get him to the doctor. No, he was making a point and they knew what he was talking about. David was saying, in essence, who is this man talking like that about God who has no covenant with God? David, the first, notice this. The thing David points out about Goliath first is that he is a man with no covenant. And you're sitting here letting him talk like that about God? Here's a dude with no covenant. And we're all standing here in covenant with the most high God. And you're letting this joker with no covenant talk like he's talking. And it made David upset. 
made him mad. Why? Because he loved God. He loved God. So notice, as he said that, this uncircumcised Philistine, who, who, who is he that he should defy the armies of the living God? Look at verse 27. This always makes people mad when you step out like that. And the people answered him in the same way. So it shall be done to the man who kills him. And look at his brothers. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption, the evil of your heart. For you've come down to see the battle. So notice what he's saying. He, he's accusing David. You're shirking your responsibilities and sneaking away from your work so you can just come down here and see the battle. That's the exact opposite of what David was doing. Look at this accusation from his brother. I know the evil that's in your heart. You snuck down here. You're shirking your, who's watching the sheep? Why are you here? You're not a soldier. You're just down here skipping out on work to watch the battle. The exact opposite of why David was there. David was there because his father sent him there on a mission and he was being obedient and faithful to the word of his father, Jesse. That's why David was there. Not to shirk his responsibilities. He was carrying out his responsibilities. Why have you come down here? I know the evil that's in your heart. Verse 29, and David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another, spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. And finally, his words were repeated before King Saul. And when they were spoken by uh, before Saul, he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail him because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're too young. And he's been a man of war since his youth. So I want you to see a couple of things, things that are happening here. First of all, the people around David that know him are getting angry at him for even being where he's called to be. He hasn't even done anything yet. And they're already getting upset at him because he's in a place of his faithfulness. Remember, he's not there. He's supposed to be there. His father sent him there. Now, let me just give, the, give you a word. As you step out, I mean, before you even accomplish great things, there will already be those that will be upset with you for stepping into the thing God's called you to do. There will always be people that try to oppose you just for stepping in. You've not even accomplished your first thing yet, and people are mad. They step in. Well, how, how, I don't know who she thinks she is. I don't know who she thinks she is. Notice what David, and he turned away from him to talk to somebody else. Notice he just ignored that whole thought process. Are there going to be people that act like that? Sure. Sure there will be. But do you have to engage all that? No. Just let it roll off your back. Turn and deal with others. You don't have to answer them. You don't have to give an explanation of yourself. And Well, you know, I really feel that, you know, you know, when he's here, and his brother's yelling at him. He doesn't go, well, don't you remember, Eliab? Uh, Samuel came to our house. And don't you remember that Samuel took out his horn of oil and anointed me? And you were there. I, it was in front of you. And don't you remember he anointed me with the horn of oil? And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God came upon me mightily. Don't you remember that, Eliab? He didn't mess with any of that. He didn't try to jog his memory. Let him say what he wants to say. He turned and started speaking to someone else. Don't, you don't have to engage that nonsense. When people get upset because you've taken steps of faith, they get upset, they get offended because you've now stood up into the thing God's called you to do. Don't let it roll off your back and don't be discouraged if people aren't all, all excited and applauding what you're called to do. If God's approval is there, who cares who's not there? I don't care. And notice, then Saul comes in and tries to speak to him in the same way. You're too young. You're not a man of war. This guy is. All these things. And then notice, the, the, the manipulation starts. The manipulation starts. And, and Saul, what does Saul tell him? Well, if you're going to do it, you know, because he finally starts giving him his previous testimonies. You don't right, remember, you don't know this about me, King, but when I was in the sheepfold, a lion came in and a bear came in. And in the same way, 
that the Lord delivered those into my hand, that same God will deliver this Philistine into my hand. Previous testimonies are preparing me for my future testimonies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My previous testimonies are preparing me for my future testimonies. My previous testimonies preparing me for my future testimonies. God takes me from where I was and higher to the greater. But I can always look back and see the previous testimonies and get excited and praise God for it and give him glory for it for my next testimony because it gives me uh, fuel for my next victory. And that's what David's saying here. In the same way I had victory before at a lesser level, I'm going to have victory now at a greater level. And the Lord will deliver this Philistine into my hand. Saul figures out I can't talk him out of this. All right. Well, listen, if, if, if you're going to do it, at least put on my armor. At least wear my armor. M miss this. Most people miss this. The king doesn't want him to wear his armor so that he'll be protected. He doesn't care about his safety. This is the same king who was hurling javelins at David during dinner, seeking to kill him tracking him all around the countryside to try to take him out. It was a manipulation tactic. I'm sure the king would have had unique armor. And I'm sure, very sure, that anybody watching from the hills may have seen, oh, look at that. The king just came out of his tent, went and slew Goliath. The king is so powerful. Man, Saul is so powerful. David said, I'm not taking your armor. I'm not taking your stuff. I've not proved it. It's not mine. I got to do it the way God has trained me to do it. Always watch out for this because when you're called to do what God's called you to do, then there will be people who try to change the way you do it. They'll try to manipulate the way you do it. They'll try to always come in. Well, we don't mind if you do that. Just do it. I'm telling you, do it this way. Do it the way I told you. It'll be so much better if you do it the way I tell you. And what are they doing? They are trying with everything in them to manipulate and control. That's what an antichrist spirit does tries to manipulate and control the way that you live your life and do what God's called you to do. But that's not how God moves. He said, I'm going to show you. I'm going to do it the way that I've been trained to do it. I'm going to do the way that God's always anointed me to do it. So you know the story. He went out and he took uh, five smooth stones. He had his sling and he goes out onto the battlefield. Doesn't even have any armor on. And he starts to engage Goliath in this conversation. Goliath's offended. Who, am I a dog that you send me this boy to fight with me? And he said, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air. And I'm going to cut you. And David cuts him off. I'll feed your flesh to the birds of the air. I'll cut your head off. Which, by the way, as I've preached many times before, is a massive statement of faith because David didn't have a sword. <laughs> David had no sword. But he's speaking by faith. I will cut your head off. I will feed your flesh to the birds of the air. <laughs> I love it. Notice this. David said to the Philistines, this is verse 45, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel that you've defied this day. The Lord will deliver you into my hand. I'll strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. And when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And he put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead. That's a serious, that's a serious throw. And he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. <clears throat> then David ran over and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of the sheath, and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now, I want, I want you to get this in your spirit. First of all, God put Goliath's weapon into David's hand. 
the thing that was formed against him worked on his behalf. <laughs> the thing that was formed against David and formed against Israel was put into David's hand and worked on his behalf. That's number one. But the Lord showed me this, and I never had really thought of this before until the Lord started dealing with me about it. Imagine as you, if you were there and ran up on David after he killed Goliath and he's holding Goliath's sword and he swings down and cuts that head off of the giant. Imagine if you could smell David's hands at that moment. Can you imagine if they still smelled like bread and cheese? Carrying the bread and the cheese to the battlefield. What if he still smelled like the 10 cheeses he was bringing to the commander? The bread that he was bringing to his brothers. His hands still smelled like his faithfulness. His hands still smelled like his humility. His hands still smelled like his responsibilities. Get that in your spirit. It still smelled like his meekness. The hands that carried cheese. The only reason he was there was to carry cheese. But the hands that were willing to carry cheese are the hands that were qualified to sling the stone. The hands that were qualified to swing the sword. The hands that were qualified to carry the head back through the camp. I feel the Holy Ghost on that. The hands that carried cheese, the hands that carried bread, were the hands that were qualified to swing the sword, to throw the stone, to, cut, to carry the head. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, I'll tell you something even further. Now, this is not biblical canon or anything like that, but uh, it is found in some rabbinical literature and as, as, a, as a Jewish history. You could study it for yourself and, and see what you think about it, but how amazing of a thought. When Jesus was crucified, he was crucified at Golgotha, uh, the which, you know, which means the place of the skull, if you don't know that. The, the place where Jesus was crucified means the place of the skull. There is some traces of Jewish literature that believe that after David cut Goliath's head off, brought it back through, that it was buried in a certain place. The skull was buried in a certain place. And there are some who believe that that is what the place of the skull was. They believe that Golgotha was where Goliath's skull was literally under that hill. And that when Jesus, the son of David, was placed upon the cross and the cross was put in the ground, that he was still reigning victorious over the giant that had opposed Israel all of those years before that time. Hallelujah. That when he said it is finished, in a type and shadow, how one man, David, struck down the opposition and an entire nation won the victory. That's called a vicarious victory. When an entire nation benefited from one man's actions, David was the only man that fought, but all of Israel got to be free. Jesus was the only man that fought, and all of us got to be free. In the same way that David struck down the giant in the natural, the son of David struck down the spiritual giant. One man fought, but we all gained the victory. And the power of God was reigning supreme in the place of the skull where the cross sat on top. <laughs> it was a it's like a picture going back. We were victorious then and we're victorious now. The first victory was for actual Israel. The second victory was for spiritual Israel. And all of us that would come into the family of God because of what Jesus did. So powerful that Jesus was crucified at the place of the skull. David, it was his faithfulness that brought him to the place of victory. I'm talking about 
something that you can do, the same that David did, that takes you from victory to victory to victory, from open door to open door to open door. It is your humility. It is your faithfulness to the calling of God that's upon your life that keeps you in a supernatural place of open doors and victory. There's no other reason that David should have been on that battlefield that day. There's no other reason except his obedience to his father's instruction. His hands that carried and did work that looked like it was unimportant. I mean, carrying bread and cheese is not a life-changing task. Doing a work that looked like it was unimportant, but it changed not just David's life, but it changed the whole fabric of a nation's freedom in one moment. Because of what? Faithfulness and meekness. Put those two words in the chat today. Faithfulness and meekness. If you're taking notes, write them down. If you're listening on the podcast, write them down. Faithfulness and meekness. Glory to God. One hand, faithfulness. One hand, meekness. Carrying bread, carrying cheese, but holding a sling, holding a sword. Hallelujah. Faithfulness and meekness. Faithfulness and meekness. Next level. That's next level. Two hands. One carried bread. One carried cheese. One held a sling. One hold, uh, held a sword. And then both holding the head of the giant. Whew. Faithfulness and meekness. Powerful. And that's what God's going to do through you. That's what God's going to do through us. This is our year to see divine possession. Ownership. How? Through faithfulness through meekness. I'm staying humble. I'm staying hungry. I'm faithful. I'm meek. I'm ready for God to open doors. I'm ready for him to get the glory. I'm ready for God to bring me to the next level. It all happens through faithfulness and meekness, faithfulness and meekness. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, and as I'm getting ready to pray for you, I'm telling you, this is going to open doors for us. Don't allow anything to keep you in a place of pride don't allow anything to keep you in a place of haughtiness or even get you into a place like that. Stay humble. Stay hungry. Watch what God can do through your humility, through your faithfulness, through your responsible action of faith. Doors are opening. Provision and promotion are coming. And you'll have a testimony in your hand that will blow your mind as you see what God's about to do. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your precious anointing. I ask you, Lord, today, for every person that's watching, those that are listening, as they are faithful, as they stay in humility and meekness, I pray today in Jesus' name that every door that the enemy tried to keep shut to them would swing open. I pray, Lord, that this would be a May filled with miracles. I pray, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that promotion will come from the only one that it come, can come from, you. Your word declares promotion does not come from the east, west, or south. Promotion comes from the Lord. And he alone decides who will rise and who will fall. And so we thank you, Lord, that you're the one that brings promotion. We thank you, Lord, that our faithfulness is putting us in position for that promotion. And so, Lord, we ask you to do it so supernaturally that even the unbeliever will have to admit you did it. We thank you for that. We ask you, Lord, that whatever the devil thought he could use to harass us and our families and our children, that you would today strike it down by your mighty right hand. Strike down every attack of the enemy against our lives by the power of your spirit. We give you honor for that glory. We give you praise. We declare you are great and greatly to be praised. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. We give you all the glory. If you believe it, somebody shout amen, throw some fire up, throw some hands up in the comments. And I want you to get ready to sow a seed today. Now, we're in Crawfordsville, Indiana. We're in three, three weeks of revival right now, back to back to back. We're here in Crawfordsville. We're going to be going to Danville, Kentucky, then to Bardstown, uh, Kentucky, uh, for another week of revival. And then we're going on to Johnson uh, City, Tennessee, for the first tent meeting of the summer. And it's in the spring. 
And so three straight weeks of revival, I want to challenge you to sow into revival. We had full altars in the morning yesterday, people being saved, giving their hearts to Jesus Christ. We're, we're seeing God move all through this nation. Will you be a part of what God's doing in these final moments of time? And so I want you to go to miracleword.com. I want you to sow your seed today. I want you to consider partnering with us if you've never done that. You can always click the partner page. You'll see there everything that's taking place through the ministry, uh, but also you can fill out the form. Let me ask this question. What could you do on a monthly basis financially to stand with us as we're doing what God's called us to do? You become a part of it. But maybe there's people that can stand with us at $100 a month, $250 a month, $500, $1,000, whatever. The Lord asks you to do. Step out in faith and do it. This is what we're going to do. For all of those that are standing with us in the month of May, uh, those that are sowing $1,000 or more, we're going to be sending you as a gift three things. Number one, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown's book, The Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Number two, Brother Hagin's book, The Triumphant Church. And then, of course, the Net Study Bible with 60,000 translators' notes is our gift to you. For those that uh, are sowing $250 or more, we're going to send you those two books, uh, just minus the Study Bible, as our way of saying thank you for standing with us uh, in the month of May. If you'd like to receive any of those after you've sown your seed, you need to go to miracleword.com forward slash offer. And from there, you'll be able to... Uh, Give us how you sowed your seed and your address so that we can send it to you. It's our way of saying thank you. It's our way of saying that we love you and appreciate you standing with us. Uh, don't forget we're live uh, tonight, tomorrow, Wednesday, 7 o'clock on all platforms. And uh, also I want to say, uh, if you've not gotten a chance to grab your last gen t-shirt before they run out, go to shop.miracleword.com and uh, grab one of them before they're gone. They're going very quickly and there's only a limited run. So you have an opportunity to get in on that before they're done. I'll be back again in the morning, 1030. And then, of course, tonight at 7 o'clock p.m. I love you. Have a powerful day. And I'll talk to you soon. Later. I want to encourage your faith. Because if you listen to the news, if you listen to the reports that are going out, they'll try to put you in panic mode. But when you serve a God who is El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one, you don't have to be afraid about anything that the devil's planning to do because you're not a part of this world system. We're separated out into God's system. And let me tell you, heaven doesn't go into a recession. joy into your spirit. You can literally hear the word of God being preached and it drive depression out of your life. Drive anxiety attacks and panic attacks out of your life. You can receive the word of God and suicidal thoughts have to loose you and let you go because there's power in the word that brings joy and peace into your spirit man. Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.